I'm sure you've been hearing about how the US government is selling off parcels of land for incredibly cheap, you could get your very own lighthouse or abandoned Department of Wildlife building for a few thousand dollars. They say it's so these buildings and sites can be maintained by private citizens rather than continue to spiral into disrepair. Recent experience has led me to the conclusion that the real reason is far more sinister. I knew it was going to need some work when I saw the pictures, peeling paint, doors taken off their hinges, the thin spiral staircase leading to the top was missing a step, but with a starting bid of $1,000. On the off chance that it worked out, it was worth it. I threw out a dollar over the minimum bid late at night, and then went to bed with zero expectations, none too fondly recalling the old eBay days, where someone would jump in and outbid you at the last minute. So I was genuinely shocked to wake up to an email that I'd actually won. It didn't take long for me to realize I was in way over my head. The excitement I'd felt over owning a place of my own dissolved the moment I saw the tall gray structure looming above me on the horizon. The picture on the website had shown the quintessential red and white striped lighthouse with turquoise waters and the deep blue sky as a backdrop. This building was a stark gray pitted stone tower sitting atop a windowless cement base. I checked the paperwork. This was the correct address. I tried the code on the lockbox. It worked. I emailed the contact information from the website, but I wasn't sure what else to do while I was waiting other than check out the inside. As I walked the narrow and winding path to the door, I couldn't help but notice how the beach grass and flowers that dotted the rest of the landscape stopped abruptly at the beginning of the pathway. Seabirds too, stayed far away. Walking in, I was overwhelmed by the amount of work I could tell that the place was going to need. It was even worse than the pictures had indicated. Paint had long peeled off, revealing large patches of discoloration on the walls and ceiling. Doors from the small rooms had been taken off their hinges and used to board up the entrance to the cement cylinder that served as the base. There was a sort of heaviness I felt the moment I stepped over the threshold. At the time, I chalked it up to buyer's remorse from seeing the level of disrepair it had fallen into. I've since come to believe that when a place is exposed to centuries of death, loneliness, and madness, it becomes as much part of it as the floors, or walls, or roof. The company replied, they seemed as confused as I was about the pictures, and apologized for the mix-up. It seemed like an innocent mistake. It probably should have deterred me, but I was still caught up in the high of owning my own land, picturing moving out of my apartment, not having a rent or mortgage. Well, I was right in a way. I certainly won't need to worry about rent again, or a mortgage, or anything else outside of this place. For that matter, I'd reached out to several contractors, trying to line up repairs. Floors, walls, doors, stairs, you name it, there was something wrong with it. Most had straight up turned me down when they heard where the job would be, some politely, but nervously declined. Others just hung up on me. It took me weeks to finally find someone from two towns over that was willing to come out and even take a look. He was a friendly guy that introduced himself as Joey and offhandedly mentioned he was surprised to see the place with another new owner so soon. Before I could ask any follow-up questions to that, he was off measuring and jotting down notes and then disappeared up the stairs. As the sun began to set, I realized it had been hours since I'd last seen him. I saw his pickup, still sitting outside, and called around for him. I walked up to the very top, careful to avoid the missing step, taking in the briny air. While searching the perimeter, I checked each of the small rooms with their peeling paint and stained floors. I went to the bottom and then reluctantly to the only place I hadn't looked yet, the cement cylinder at the base. I'd stuck my head down there the very first day after removing the barricades and immediately decided it was a place I'd prefer to never visit again. It was made up of a series of narrow and dark concrete tunnels stained with rust and filled with a dank mildewy smell. Without windows or power, it was pitch black there even during the brightest of days. I opened the door and called out for him, but my own voice echoing back at me was the only response. Reluctantly, I descended, shining my flashlight around the interior of the tunnels and trying to convince myself that I definitely could find my way back and probably wouldn't be trapped down there forever. At the end of one of the passageways, I saw something that surprised me, a set of ancient looking stairs that led downwards. 
I was confused because the cylinder was at the very bottom. Anything below it would have been solid rock and eventually the ocean. I found my palms sweating so profusely at the thought of going down those stone steps that I nearly dropped my flashlight. I called his name weakly but heard nothing. It was unnervingly quiet, a sort of thick silence that was heavy on the air. I hesitated. Part of me just longed to be in the lighted interior of my car, doors locked. On the way back to my crappy apartment, it would have been easy enough to get lost down there, and the thought of otherwise abandoning someone else to the darkness encouraged me to fight through my own fears and continue onward. I took a deep breath and cautiously took the first step. The tunnels just a dark blur behind me. The stairs formed a spiral downwards, and as I descended, it felt as if the pitted walls began to close in around me as I continued down what seemed like an endless amount of stone steps. I knew I had to have been impossibly far down, at least 10 stories below the ground level. I still saw no sign of Joey. My voice had long since stopped echoing as the space around me had narrowed. Every so often I'd come across graffiti, drawings, tally marks scribbled or scratched into the walls. At the top of the stairs, someone had started in the middle of a lawn and rambling letter to a loved one that wrapped along the ever narrowing walls in cramped handwriting. The further I continued downwards, the content devolved into nonsense. Words were written on top of each other and strung together to form meaningless sentences and then eventually stopped altogether. Different handwriting had picked up where it left off and had simply said they are waiting. Others seemed to have underlined and circled the phrase in agreement as they too walked by. After I passed an I'm not ready yet that looked to have been written in blood, I decided that I was done reading graffiti and that I focused strictly on the stairs, the darkness, the narrowing walls, the slick steps. I paused at one point and wondered why I was still going, but besides the guilt if I gave up, I felt compelled to, eager almost, just as the space became so tight that the stone painfully scraped against my shoulders. The stairs sharply stopped at a small platform that opened into a tiny room, the first I'd seen since I'd been down here. The walls were covered with apologies, goodbyes, confessions, love letters, some written, some carved into the stone. Of those that were still legible, some were written in anguish, others with fear, some were just pure madness, but not one of them expressed hope. Someone had written exit here in large, disjointed letters with a crudely drawn arrow pointing downwards to a hatch on the floor. I hesitated for a moment, knowing there was nothing below us but rock and ocean and I should have hit those hours ago, but decided I'd come all this way, I might as well keep going. It led to even more stairs, but this time the steps were that of a tight iron spiral staircase, one step missing. I felt a sudden stale breeze as I descended. There were windows around me that opened into the pitch black night. It was so dark outside that I hadn't even realized they were windows at all at first. I froze, confused. I wasn't sure how I managed to get myself so utterly turned around. I knew I'd been walking downwards the entire way. I was certain of it. Yes, I was tired, it was dark, but I knew up from down. I heard a sound from below, a whirring, and thought I'd finally found Joey or somehow, some sort of exit, something, anything but more stairs. Believed, I decided to continue downwards, upwards, the direction I'd been going. At the bottom was a ladder leading to another hatch on the floor. I climbed down, opened it, and, to my utter confusion, found myself standing at the top of the lighthouse. I grasped for the railing to orient and braced myself against the strong, stinging wind. I couldn't see the moon, stars, any light reflecting on the water around me. It was somehow darker outside than it had been in the tunnels, an unlit stairwell, darker than I had previously thought possible. The choppy black waters of the sea were indistinguishable from the sky, the land. Even with the steady flash of the strangely tinted automated light, the whirring I'd heard, I could see very little. At first, I felt a wave of relief at seeing Joey's car was gone. He'd made it out, but it was short-lived when I realized that mine was gone too. The shore, the beach houses in the distance, everything was gone. The wind had picked up instead of the light, and briny sea air it was heavy in my lungs and had a smell, earthiness mixed with something else that I couldn't place at the time. Although I couldn't see much of anything beyond the railing when the light above flashed, I could just make out pale, nearly translucent forms being tossed along in the black water far in the distance. 
when I finally managed to look away from the hypnotizing motion of whatever was floating in the waves, I realized the slick floor was littered with items, Joey's shoes, notepad, and tool belt. A woman's purse, leather peeling from the constant barrage of the black water, piles, and piles of neatly folded clothes. I panicked, opened the hatch I'd come down, up, through. I was relieved to see steps leading down. I rushed back down the metal stairs, slipping from the dark water that had splashed against my shoes before making it back to the platform. I ran as fast as my tired legs would allow past the hundreds of additional they are waiting messages I had missed the first time. It wasn't until I reached the top of the stone steps that I paused for the first time and I took deep gulping breaths in relief until I saw it. Exit here, the arrow pointing upwards. I told myself I must have missed that on the way down. I laughed, even chiding myself for my forgetfulness as I reached for the opening to the hatch, eager to return to the dank interior of the cement cylinder. I never would have thought I'd be happy to see that pitch black series of tunnels again. My laughter turned to misery. I think I sobbed that first time when the fetid breeze hit my face, bringing with it that smell of old things, welcoming things. My phone said it was 6.45 AM, but it never got any lighter outside. The pale things in the sea below moved along with the waves, their tangled limbs just a bit clearer in the closer proximity. I opened the hatch and climbed back down. But slowly that time, wobbly with exhaustion, when I descended and reached the platform, and little room again, exit here pointing downwards at the hatch, I didn't even bother opening it for the longest time. Eventually, I knew I needed to, just in case, I made it to see. I started to lose track of how many times I made that fruitless journey. That always ended the same way, with me stepping outside into the endless night. I didn't start my own tally marks right away, but it's been 40 trips since I started counting. By the seventh recorded time I had stepped out into the darkness, I was laughing. I needed to see the water. I had to breathe in that air. It was an urge that I could not fight. The pale forms and the dark waters moved with the current. Closer, further away, closer, further, closer, closer, closer still. I've been trying to conserve my phone battery ever since I found I have a faint signal in the exact middle of the stairs. I've been so tempted to call for help, an overwhelming urge, that is still hard to fight even though I know I'd be dooming them as well. According to the date, I've been stuck here for a week with no food or water. At one point I tripped and smashed my head on the stone steps based on the sound and the blood and injury that should have been fatal. Even death refuses to grant me reprieve. I've memorized every they are waiting written along the walls, every word of each confession. I've even written a few messages of my own. One is on the wall, with the others, short, streaky, and written in the only medium I could find. For whomever is unfortunate to follow in my footsteps, end this post. A warning to others that may also be tempted to accept a deal. That seems too good to be true. Although much of it is illegible, I do think the graffiti was right about two things. That out into the stale air into the embrace of the dark sea, that is truly the exit, the only way out. And, judging by the slap of wet footsteps on the hatch above my head, they are waiting for me.